big pleasure to have these three great scholars and colleagues of mine to go over today the uh, legal implications of uh, asymmetry cryptography in Switzerland and try to answer the question, why is Switzerland's regulatory framework attractive if we don't conclude at the end that it is not? And as an honor to our foreign uh, guest uh, here in Geneva today, I would like to introduce you first my, the person on my left, Hubert de Vauplan, a partner and head at, of the Alternative, Alternative Finance team at the law firm Kramer Levine LP. Uh, Mr. de Vauplan is also a university professor teaching international banking and financial law at the Paris Institute uh, of Political Science, better known for French-speaking attendance today as Sciences Po. Uh, on his left, Dr. Uh, Andreas Glarner. Andreas uh, is uh, the uh, co-head, uh, the other, the only guest uh, of the other side of the Serene River, by the way, uh, is the co-head of the law firm MME's FinTech Practice Group. He has an extensive experience in the area of FinTech payment and DLT, where he advises market participants in all legal, regulatory and compliance matters. He is an expert at the interface between technology and regulation and hence advises developers of decentralized software architectures, smart contract systems and applications. And on my far left, I have the pleasure to welcome here Dr. Jacques Ifland, a partner at Lenze Stelin Capital Market Practice Group, specializing in corporate law, securities regulation and mergers and acquisitions, with an emphasis on transactions involving public companies. Dr. Infland practiced mainly in Geneva, where he also acts as a chairman of the Capital Market and Technology Association, CMTA. So, maybe I would like to start, to start with you, uh, Dr. Glarner, if you please, and have then the, uh, the, the views of uh, Dr. Ifland. I know some people disagree with the term of distributed ledger technologies, uh, but let's stick to that word for, for, for this morning. In December 2018 was published the important federal report, council report, legal framework for DLT in Switzerland. Then in March 2019, a preliminary bill from the Federal Department of Finance. And finally, in November, the draft bill from the federal council and message uh, came out. So how would you simply summarize for the public, there are majority non jurists here, why this process was a big path forward for Switzerland as regards DLTs? <laughs> Big question, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, welcoming me here as well. Um, well, basically, I think we need to look back a, a couple of years. Uh, I think we in Switzerland, we had the advantage that our regulator FIMA had a chance to start um, thinking about DLT technology since the very early days, 2013 to 2014, that very initial exchange started in 2018. They launched their ICO guidelines, which was uh, somewhat a milestone in history on, on, a, on a global level, as it, I think it was the first uh, guidelines issued by any regulator worldwide on a token qualification. Um, however, uh, the time has shown and the discussion with FIMA and, and, and also the, the uh, legislator has shown that uh, the guidelines itself, they may be useful in practice, but they don't solve all the questions. And so uh, luckily enough, we had the chance that the Federal Council took up on that and, and reviewed it. What they actually did, they did uh, some, what we call that a gap analysis. So basically they looked through all the different legislations we had and kind of tried to identify it which pieces were missing or which pieces were somehow in the, in the way for a digitalization of our society with regard to DLT technology in particular, but it should be technology neutral. So what they came up with now at the very end, and um, you're welcome to add on your comments on that uh, later on. Basically, they tried to fix those issues on, on a civil law basis to make sure that we know how tra to transfer and to transact with a particular set of token, counterparty token. We'll get back to that a bit later maybe. Uh, how to do custody services without uh, risking uh, that a token would fall into a bankruptcy as, uh, in a, the estate of a bankrupt uh, custodian. They looked at it from a, a trading perspective. They looked at it from um, uh, a national banking perspective. So basically, the, the idea was to use a technology-friendly way to fit 
fill in the gaps and holes in the current legislation. But still, we have to change around 10 federal legislations. Uh, Dr. Riflin, is it, is it a comparative advantage to, uh, for example, Liechtenstein, who has only one dedicated legislation, as we did for the Intermediate Securities <laughs> Act? Well, you know, if you could compare the situation with what happened back in the 1990s where the Internet came. So you could imagine, for example, some guy in Bern being tasked with, uh, well, receiving the task to prepare legislation about the Internet because, oh, something's big coming, Internet is changing the way we're doing things, so you have to legislate that. Now, with hindsight, we know this would not have been possible because the Internet is not a discrete thing. It's, it, it changes the way we are doing things. And I think this is the same approach which has been taken by our federal authorities. And I think that's the right one. It's not about you know, dealing with DLT in general because DLT can have, as we have seen today, many, many applications in every aspect of current life. So the point is rather to address uh, surgically the points where it needs to be. And I think this is what the, the, the draft is doing. And I think they actually they have done a pretty good job. But so we, we also have to make a comparative analysis to different legal systems. Otherwise, we cannot answer the question to why is Switzerland's regulatory regime uh, attractive. So uh, that's a question for you, Professor de Vauvelin. Uh, you may certainly know, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Glarner just said it, that uh, in February 2018, a uh, 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 report by FINMA was released, the guide, guidelines, uh, ICO guidelines, in which we had the three different categories, payment token, uh, security token, utility token, and hybrid. How is that different, if at all, in French law? I will not answer to the French law. <laughs> I will answer to the EU law, the EU law. because that is, it is better. And you, the process you described is totally different in Europe. Don't forget Europe is not a country, nor a confederation of federation. It is an area where sovereign countries delegate the sovereignty to legislate to the EU Commission. And then what does it mean? We have three categories of uh, competence. The exclusive competence, the shared competence, and the cooperation competence. The shared competence is internal market. For instance, banking, insurance, capital market. When it is shared competence, it means that EU Commission has only the possibility to propose something to the member states. If it is not a shared competence, it could be a cooperative competence, this is not the case, or an exclusive competence, which is not the case too. What about for crypto and for blockchain? It could be, it should be in the internal market, but it is not yet in the internal market. It means that nor the EU Commission, nor the ESMA, the EBA, or anybody in Europe has competence to legislate or to propose something until the EU Commission still propose something to the member states. This is why, as of today, we see a lot of reports coming from various organizations in Europe, including ECB, including Europe, European Banking Authority, or ESMA, to propose what is the current situation with the current legislation in Europe, but not to propose something as you did it in Switzerland. And this is for you a, a, positive, and a, a, a positive way because you will have more time to implement something in Switzerland when in Europe it will take at least between three to five or six years at least to implement the new legislation on blockchain and, 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 uh, and crypto. One example. Do you know why Malta or France has enacted uh, specific legislation on blockchain? And why not Malta can do the same for electronic signature or for e-identity? Because electronic signature or e-identity are today shared competency with full harmonization, exclusive competence of the EU Commission. When crypto is not yet the competence of the Commission. This is why today we see some member states, as France or Malta, and next year, this year Germany, with new legislation on blockchain and, and, uh, and crypto, 
until the EU Commission will take the lead and say, stop, this yeah. is my job. Yeah. So it, it would that be short-term initiatives, the, the chance from the Liechtenstein to have addressed the dedicated blockchain act, you think it's, uh, you're running against time here, uh, according to what Professor Devoplan just said, Andreas, from a Liechtenstein perspective? Um, well, I believe the, the Liechtenstein perspective and the way they have done that is, is a completely different path than Switzerland has taken and the, the EU obviously also uh, needs to take. But it's also a different path than, than other jurisdictions like Malta or Gibraltar take. Uh, I think when it, we talk about Malta or Gibraltar, uh, I think legislation is also to a certain degree a marketing case. Um, when we talk about Liechtenstein, uh, I would dare to say that this is not correct uh, to apply that. Uh, what has Liechtenstein has done, they really focus on a trusted technology law, that's what they call, everybody calls it blockchain law, that's not entirely correct. Uh, however, um, what they done, they, they looked at it from a, a complete perspective. What we Swiss do, we, we tend to regulate um, so-called security token in a way. So token which represents a counterparty claim and now we have a new law hopefully to be implemented uh, within the next uh, 12 months sometime. Um, how to do the transfers of these type of token. Liechtenstein's assessment is a different one. They look at, at the whole token ecosystem as such. Uh, so it also addresses uh, counterparty less token and the custody and the trading, the transferability of these. So what they have to create is a so-called container. Uh, and in this container, there's the token which can represent practically anything. And as long as the token is issued along the guidelines of the new legislation and with the approvals required for that, we don't need to get into detail for that, then we have legal certainty around transferability and trading. And that's, isn't it something that, from that point of view, the CMTA or, or legislation would disagree uh, from MME, I'm not trying to make you fight to each other, but as regards the fact that from a CMTA point of view, and, and, and as we see in the draft legislation, there's a, there's a lot of weighted tokens are always trying to be considered as securities. Well, also from an economic point of view, as we did within the US, uh, the Security Exchange Commission, it's very easy to fall in the category of security. And, and, uh, and that's why uh, MME has, is, is trying to, to, to think differently about the, trying to have a qualification that comes above based on their function. I don't know if either one of you will want to react to that. Well, um, well, speaking for CMTA, I think there's this, uh, I mean, this absolute ne neutrality about the question of how a token should be categorized. The point is just that back in nine, uh, 2018, when the um, FINMA issued its guidance, what essentially it says is, you guys, many things you think are utility tokens are in reality uh, security tokens. And then many people th thought it was an end of it, the end of freedom, the end of the Wild West in the, in the, uh, in the blockchain, uh, blockchain world. But that was probably a reaction that was triggered by Anglo-Saxon influence where the categorization as security is very onerous because it means that you are, you are required to comply with many regulations with which if you're a small company, many, well, it's often not possible. The point is just in Switzerland, it's not the same. In fact, in Switzerland, the categorization of security is, is, is relatively favorable because true, you, often you have to make a prospectus, but the prospectus requirement are not that onerous as they are elsewhere in the world. Um, and you don't need to have, um, uh, you know, license. It's not a regulated activity to issue securities. So in the end, uh, this is a very favorable um, uh, characterization. And what CMT has tried to do is to just to try to help those issuers who want to do that, to do that in a legal and, and satisfactory way. But you know, the, there's no no proselytism in that, and in, in, in you know those who want for wh whose business model is aimed as as utility tokens, for example, that's particularly fine. It's just a different business model. Um, 
Yeah, uh, I mean, I fully agree. Also, from our perspective, I think it's just important to note, uh, we believe that utility token models are not dead. There still uh, are going to be many of them around. Whenever, uh, and we, we prefer to call them native token and counterparty-less token in our token qualification idea. And I think the only point worth mentioning here that what we miss as part of the new, new DLT framework regulations that uh, the Federal Council missed the opportunity to look at the different token functional functionalities as a whole and really focused on the counterparty right token. And so we still have a, a certain lack of, of legislation regarding the holding property and the transferability of token, which are so-called native or utility token. That would have been great if the Federal Council's DLT uh, framework would address that as well, but uh, unfortunately it didn't. I mean, the ownership aspect of the token or the crypto cryptocurrency is strictly sensitive. Because we're going to come back to that, but I would like to also have a, a professor develop plan on one particular thing, because we have the chance, we had a chance to meet before, and there's something very interesting you, you told us at that, at that occasion as regards, and that's a French point of view, by the way, is that uh, token cannot change category through time. Maybe you can dis discuss a little bit that, because we have seen uh, a means of payment evaluating, I'm talking about the Ether, that's more obvious one, who started as being a utility token to access the platform and deploy smart contracts, as it later moves to be actually used as a means of payment to purchase uh, 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 services or to uh, on the Ethereum blockchain. So from a French point of view, I remember having you saying that it's not possible. You stick it to one category and that's it, forever. Yeah, this is not specifically due to the French uh, view, this is due to the, to the EU vision of, uh, again, I come back. Why? Okay. Because in the EU, we have the definition of financial instrument. And we cannot change this definition. It is or it is not a financial instrument. It is an instrument, whatever you call it. Uh, fall within the definition of financial instrument, it is a financial instrument. In the meaning, it is a security. Okay, what we did in France, in fact, we are blocked with the EU definition. As I mentioned before, it is, it is a, a, a competency of the, of the Commission. What we can do is only to legislate in a, in a land which is not yet today in the competence of the EU Commission. So we did it for the non-financial instrument, the so-called utility token, even though we didn't Took, didn't take this uh, terminology because we think it is not uh, appropriate in France, but this is why we have, uh, uh, we have a legislation where, because it is not a security, because it is not a financial instrument, it is something else, something different, something different, which fall, nothing in, which fall not in an area which is covered by the EU Commission. And then, if you look about the, the last paper published few days before Christmas last year by the EU Commission, which is interesting because it's the first step of the EU to say, stop, stop, I will now take the lead. I will take the lead because first I will make a consultation. This is the purpose of this paper. And in this consultation, one of the questions is taxonomy. One of the questions is taxonomy, whether or not and how EU will uh, 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 categorize uh, uh, tokens and whether or not we need to take this description in, in Switzerland, for instance, or another one. And if you look about this consultation, which is free uh, to the EU Commission uh, website, of course, uh, if you look about this consultation, you will see that, okay, for the EU Commission, there is two, it is blanket white uh, uh, again, it is token of, uh, token are somewhere in one EU definition, and in this case, the EU Commission has nothing to do, because it is yet covered by the, by the EU uh, regulatory framework, or tokens are not covered by any EU definition. In this case, the EU Commission will propose a new draft of regulation for those tokens. Again, black and white. But the reality is, of course, grey. And how we can do, as you mentioned before in our discussion, when tokens have a double uh, 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 ca capacity to be a payment, an asset, uh, uh, and potentially an asset which is an underlying asset which is a security. We'll see. We'll see what the EU Commission will propose. But as of today, keep in mind this very strange aspect about uh, the possibility to do something in each member state. By the way, huh, uh, Gibraltar is a strange animal. Uh, Liechtenstein is not part of, uh, as for you, uh, is part of the EEA. And as you know, the EEA has very various possibilities to, 
to, to follow the EU legislation, if I look about Switzerland, for instance, you keep your own power to accept the EU legislation, but you know that the uh, EU Commission has some if we have constraints. Exactly. If we, if we have the choice. Huh? If you have the choice. And look about uh, the EU Commission position about uh, the Swiss stock exchange. And yeah. They refuse to Absolutely. renew uh, 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 the, the recognition. Yeah, so we have another problem. We have some, some few time left. We have another problem that's interesting and could imply you three. It's the non-recognition from the legal regime. So really, legally speaking, no one owns data. Legally speaking, no one owns a crypto. No one owns a token. And we see this discrepancy with, with common law jurisdiction where it's much easier to at least recognize. Uh, there was this, this uh, High Court of Justice uh, uh, in UK uh, ruling where people recognize the, 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 the right, uh, also uh, like a property on Bitcoin. Um, are we it's missing a mix of property. It is not a yeah. pure uh, property. But are we mixing? Are we missing? Are we missing the train here in in, in codified uh, jurisdictions? Uh, co uh, because we're missing the protection from the investor's point of view and the depositor's point of view that those common law jurisdiction would allow, based on the fact that uh, you can own a token. Words, uh, again, if you look about this, uh, uh, this uh, consultation from the uh, EU Commission, you will see two questions. One, whether or not we need to do something on civil law, in civil law meaning that the uh, EU civil law, meaning that it doesn't exist in the EU civil law, but whether or not we need to do something to recognize ownership or something similar for crypto. This is one of the questions. Second question is how can we protect uh, uh, end users or, or holders of token in case of bankruptcy? Knowing that bankruptcy is not an harmonized again uh, 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 legislation in EU, it means that it is today uh, member state uh, uh, power and capacity. But this is the two questions: whether or not we need to define a specific civil law uh, 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 design specifically for ownership for token. It is one of the questions, and I think the answer will be yes. We need to do it. Oh, we could do the same in Switzerland. Yeah, right. We, we should. And then Dr. Rifland. Uh, I think at the end of the day, um, uh, blockchain or DLT-based token do have very, uh, very, a lot of elements which are similar to non-property rights with the exclusive control it, they provide. So what we have seen now in the draft of the DLT regulations rela related to custody and um, the the right to uh, to make sure that token being held in with a custodian don't fall into the bankruptcy estate as they can be segregated. Um, this has already been reflected, but the deal re report doesn't address uh, property rights on token per se. So it will be uh, a question for the courts to decide that on the, law, on the short run, hopefully, at some stage. Yes, but in fact, the, the draft legislation does address many of these questions. For example, who is the uh, legal owner of um, of a security. Uh, to what extent are you protected if uh, the person who is selling the security did not have really the right to to transfer it, but you didn't know about this? How does it work if uh, your token is in is deposited with a custodian and that custodian becomes bankrupt? All these are uh, addressed, and these are actually the practical uh, implications. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I suppose it means time's up, right? Yeah. Uh, no, well, no I, but you're absolutely but correct. But I'd like to it only one. is being addressed right. with regard to security token. So the, all the other token, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all those token types out there, they're not being addressed. Correct, but they are being addressed in the practical implication, which means if you have these on a wallet, how can you get access to it? And if you transfer this to a banking institution, how can you create ownership? So the practical implications of ownership are addressed. If, but if you look at, you know, in, in the civil code, a general definition of what property is, you will not find it because this is not the way our legislation work. It's not about dogmatic construction. It's about general principle, which are then applied by courts to determine what it means. So I think we are in perfect tradition of Swiss law there and dealing with the practical implications rather than, you know, the general theory of property or things like that. We have to finish there, but I want to ask, address the last, very last question with the short answer to each of you three as regards the fact that in Switzerland we, we had a chance to see the blockchain Ethereum being developed 
Do you think from that chronological advantage, we Switzerland could be the first country to issue a stablecoin, a public stablecoin, a CBDC? Or Hubert de Vauplan, do you think uh, it's going to happen in Europe first? No, it's going to take too much time. Exactly, you have my answer. <laughs> <laughs> this is my answer, nothing to add. Okay. <laughs> well, we heard already a bit early this morning that Switzerland already has issued stable coins which work. Uh, uh, stable coin based on, on fiat assets. We are already also have a project which has been launched last September with a stable coin launched, launched on, on gold. So a property in gold, not a, not a Still country. Still private, coin. but from the SNB's point of view, from asset SNB, backed. I mean, SNB is looking into that deeply, but obviously it, there are a lot of challenges. Okay. I doubt that Switzerland is going to be the first jurisdiction okay. in the world. Final word for Dr. Eiffel. Yeah, yeah, so uh, in, in my view, the natural issue of stable coin logically would be the Bank of International, International Settlement, which is, happens to be based in Switzerland. Because in reality, it's exactly what it does, right? It has deposit of various currency for various central banks. So if the bank was tokenizing these, you would have stable coins. So uh, that would be the natural issuer for we'll this see. kind of instrument. We'll see. I thank you very much to the panelists. I think we can applaud them. Thanks. <laughs>